Gentlemen viewers and gentlemen viewers, good evening and welcome to our historical sketches show. In this episode, we will deal with a people, or we could say with an ethnic group, whose origin, whose status, history, and development are curious and in, in many ways unique, and due to some ethnic verbal identification even confusing. And I'm referring, I'm referring to the gypsies. Gypsies are a European phenomenon, but, but according to statistics, there are over one million gypsies living in America. Or rather, in America, the gypsies belong to a branch called Romani or Roma or Rom, R-O-M. And these are all denominations that have caused significant confusion in assigning to the gypsies a coherent slot in, in, in the classification of peoples. In America, however, the Romani branch of the gypsies have assimilated into society more than in Europe, to the point that, although American Romani communities are to be found in most, in most metropolitan areas, for the most part, we do not know about them. And for the record, the largest wave of Romani gypsies immigrants arrived in the United States after the abolition of the Romani slavery in Romania in 1864, and more Romani immigrated after the end of the Soviet Union. Now, one of the sources of confusion in the ethnic classification of gypsies stemmed from the association of Romani gypsies with the country of Romania and with its inhabitants, the Romanians. The association actually happens to be coincidental. The origins of the name Romania, for, for the country that is, and its associated name and language, Romanian, goes back almost 1800 years, when the Roman Emperor Trajan subdued, conquered the local populace in, in that region, which was called Dacia or Dacia. There followed, there followed a blending of the local Dacia population with the Romans, from which, from which arose a language still spoken today that has many directly Latin names mixed with words of, of we could say, barbarian or barbarian or original or from going back in times. The population is not Slavic, unlike, for example, Bulgaria and some other regions in the Balkans. In fact, whereas Serbia, Bulgaria and Macedonia use Cyrillic characters in their writing, Romania always uses and uses Latin characters. Now, this brief reference to Romania is intended to clarify that the Romani or Rom gypsies happen to take residence in large numbers in Romania, but a Rom is not an abbreviation of Romanian. The Rom, who come from Romania, are really a nomadic gypsy-type population, whereas the Romanians are those from Romania, who are not and were not nomadic, nomadic gypsies. In fact, the real Romanians regard their Rom counterparts as being something of an unwanted underclass, and in general, Romanians do not really like to be, to be associated with, with the Rom. Furthermore, the Rom are indeed gypsies, but not all gypsies are Rom, and this comes for the confusion. The term gypsy is Middle English of, or rather, is of Middle English origin, and it is a modification, abbreviation, or if you like, a distortion of the word Egyptian. And this is because when the world was mostly, was mostly a mysterious place, the belief arose that gypsies were itinerant, itinerant Egyptians and the denomination stuck in the language as an ethnic marker and, more often than not, associated with, with disparaging, disparaging connotations. However, however, the first news we have of the gypsies in the Middle East and, the Mediterranean, and, the, and in the Mediterranean area is linked to a wedding feast of impressive dimensions. The story comes from a Persian text, a Persian text that narrates the life of the Persian king Baram Gur 
of the Sassanid dynasty who ruled between 421 and 438 AD. I mentioned the Sassanid, Sassanid dynasty because in 1971, in 1971, Iran, the, in, in, in Iran, the Shah built what is now called the Azadi Monument, Azadi in, in Farsi meaning freedom, to commemorate the 2500th anniversary of the Sassanid Persian Empire. The monument was built with 8,000 8, blocks, blocks of marble from the Isfahan region of Iran. But to return to the Sassanid king Bahram Gur, to celebrate his very sumptuous wedding, as you see in this other Persian miniature, he invited from India 10,000 minstrels, musicians, and singers. They moved from India with their families and chanted and sang for days and nights to celebrate this historical wedding, historical for them. Now, when the feast was over, the king allowed this enormous party of musicians to settle on the Iranian plateau. This extraordinary journey, with which you can see in this map, starting from Punjab, from Punjab in, in, in Pakistan, through Afghanistan and eventually to Persia, had left, has left rather a trace in the oral tradition of the gypsies themselves, who have not, they have not written language. This huge group of party entertainers was led by three brothers, who were the heads of the three main tribes of the gypsies, the Rom, which I have already mentioned, the Sinti, and the Calais. Now, how and when they left Persia towards the west, it is unknown. However, however, there is a record that dark-skinned nomads who were not Arabs or Bedouins were found in Mesopotamia, today's, today's Iraq. That is, they lived among the Muslim peoples, but they did not assimilate with them. They maintained their own language, habits, and costumes. The next, the next historical reference to the gypsies is found in a large, in a large history of the Muslim word uh, with, reference, with reference to Persia. The, the, this book says that the number of gypsy prisoners captured by the Byzantines in, uh, 855, in 855, yes, who were conducted in, talks about them, who were conducted into the realm of the Eastern Roman Empire. As, as the gypsies have no history written by anyone or any of them, what we know about, about them reflects, reflects the perception that they made or left with the people in whose territory they happened, they happened to wander to, or, or, or take residence. All in all, what seems certain is that their origins were in the Punjab region of today's India and, and Pakistan. However, However, in 1094, a monk, a monk residing on Mount Athos in Greece, recorded that he saw crossing the land a band of nomads, magicians, snake charmers, and fortune tellers. And he called them Atsigani, which in Greek means the untouchables. And these new terms for the gypsies, from which the gypsy name is revived, translated into the French Tsigane and Gitano in Spanish and Gypsy in English. The very name, untouchable, implies what turned out to be almost 1,000 years of, of separation. But until the 15th century, the attitude towards the Gypsies was, we could say, neutral, or they were surrounded, they were surrounded by a halo of semi-mystery they had a kind of, they also had a kind of inside that aristocracy that negotiated with the local, with the local rulers. They built baskets, pots. They were ironmongers, blacksmith, blacksmiths, jewelers, and and horse tamers. And besides, they sang and danced as as no one else could. They lived separately from the resident population, and took off, as unpredictably as unpredictably as I had arrived in the place, which, which all contributed to surround them 
with an air, with an air of mystery. And here is a map showing the migration of the Sinti and Rom divisions of the gypsies, while in this map we also see the main distribution of the three main tribes, the Sinti, the Rom, and the Calais. In the Middle Ages, the nomadic status of the gypsies fit well, fit rather well, with the, with the status of nomads, travelers and pilgrims, from, f towards, towards whom the pilgrims there was always an obligation of, of hospitality. It is a very fatalistic, as opposed we could say, to a scientific world, a position to a scientific world, and the people who live, we would say today, outside the box. But they could find acceptance. acceptance. Sometimes they would present themselves to the local rulers and with letters armed, armed with letters of protection by popes and emperors, sometimes le forged letters, but that was not important. As a whole, people who regulated themselves according to their own customs were, by and large, accepted. And we should also keep in mind that the population density was much smaller than today, which allowed sufficient distance between groups and people to avoid unpleasant, unpleasant interferences. The change in attitude towards the gypsies parallels, parallels the development of the, of the nation states at the end, at the end of the Middle Ages. It is at this time that a reputation, a reputation for generalized thievery, begins to surround the gypsies. On the other hand, it should be noted that in periods of upheaval and social turbulence, it happened frequently. It happened frequently that criminals had and escaped convicts united, united themselves with other nomads. And therefore, a nomad, a nomad, somebody without a residence, became suspicious by definition. On the other hand, in this period, that is, at the end of the 1400, there begins to develop inside the, inside the gypsy communities a sense of guilt and kind of a sense of exclusion. Guilt due to some, we can call it, ancestral origins. And one of the legends datable to this period is the idea that gypsies were the forgers of the nails with which Christ was crucified. What would, would you believe that? And altogether, altogether this contributed to create or to increase the separation between the gypsy world and the other world, the world of the others, a feeling reinforced by mutual fear, mutual fear, mutual exclusion, and, and actually desperation. On the other hand, the process of formation of a national state also implied a tie or a bond between man and his residence, between, we could say, man and his space, between the citizen and the taxed revenue that the citizen would produce. And this also tended to limit the rights and the possibilities of movement and, the, of, of, and of the relocation of the tribes at will, as the gypsies were habituated to do. In fact, there were several forces simultaneously at play. In the cities, the cooperation of the arts, as they were called, they, today we would call them unions, the guilds, they were the guilds, they did whatever they could to limit competition from the goods manufactured and sold by other people, like in the case, in the instance of the gypsies. And in lands today, in, the, in lands today occupied by, by the states of Romania, Hungary, and, and Bulgaria, the right to reside given by local potentates by the, transformed itself into, into a, a, proper, a proper form of slavery, which was only abolished, was only abolished in the middle, in the middle of the 19th century. We can then correctly identify, identify the disenfranchising, if you like, the imagination of the gypsies with the formation and the strengthening of, of the nation states. And this is also this is also the time when gypsies become associated with witchcraft. Furthermore, furthermore, at around the 15th century, 
the Ottoman Empire, Turkish Empire, begins its drive towards Western Europe. And the gypsies were the first to flee at the beginning of any war fought, fought on the land where they happened to live, to live at the moment, at, at the particular moment. And between 1407 and 1420, numerous bands of gypsies arrived in Germany, particularly uh, Hildesheim in Basel, in, in Switzerland, what is Switzerland now, and in Strasbourg, which is now France. And all claim to have a letter claim to have a letter of protection from the emperor, and in this case, the emperor was still the of, was still emperor of the Holy Roman Empire with capital with capital in Vienna. Other gypsies arrived in Paris and claimed to flee from Egypt, where allegedly, where allegedly where they were prosecuted for being Christian. But all this is difficult to ascertain historically because Christians were not, were not prosecuted, as you know, in Muslim countries. They were only charged with attacks to, in order to profess their religion. However, probably in the midst of, of this turmoil and these wars, it is possible that various unsavory characters or bands, or bands of criminals mixed with the gypsies, which also accumulate, increase the problem. And for this number and accumulation of reasons, the gypsies ended up to ac acquiring a negative image. They were considered a danger, a source of instability, a source of disorder and, and suspicions. They were squeezed between the Ottoman Empire and the territorial and administrative structures of the West, ever searching, ever searching for more temporary residences resorting partly to agriculture in the ever more restricted <coughs> and unproductive uh, lands and, and partly resorting to trade. There were mass deportations, for example, in 1492, the same year of the discovery of America, deportation by King Ferdinand of Spain. He deported them not for religious motives, as he had already deported Arabs and Jews, but due to a growing hostility towards nomads and also due to a drive for what today we would call ethnic cleansing. And in this print, based on a drawing by Gustave Doré, we see the cave dwellings of gypsies around the Spanish city of Granada. Another famous French printmaker, print, French printmaker uh, of the Baroque era was Jacques, Jacques Caillot, has left us these representations of a group of gypsies preparing for a banquet. And in this other print, a scouting party explores the path to be followed by the gypsy tribe on the move. So that, in the last 600 years, gypsies lived between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. On one hand, nationalities tolerated strangers less and less, did not nor tolerated, frankly, diversities as we will know even today. And for this reason, they had to be constantly the gypsies. They had to be constantly on the move. On the other hand, they were occasionally forced to remain in a specific allotted, allotted restricted area or land that is a form of forced residence. However, however, gypsies managed to maintain their unwritten language their identity and, we could say, their vitality. There were efforts, maybe they're still going on, efforts by various governments, uh, efforts at forced assimilation. For example, gypsy children would be removed from their original families and given in adoption to farming families. There were incentives to insert them into organized forms of labor. And from this point of view, the efforts by the totalitarian regimes, notably Nazi Germany, to do away with the gypsies, such efforts can be viewed, can be viewed as the last of the many efforts <clears throat> to resolve what has never been called, but still nevertheless is the gypsy, the gypsy question. This image here represents a group of gypsies in the German town of Asperg, in line to board a train that will lead them to a concentration camp. The train, the train shows here carries gypsies to a specific concentration camp in Poland. 
And in this rare picture, an old gypsy woman is interviewed by, by a lady called Eva Justin, an assistant to the Nazi psychologist Robert Ritter, who theorized about the danger of the gypsy race. What he called the danger, anyway, he said. And even today, the gypsy question is still wanting or waiting for an answer. Today, gypsies, um, of course I'm talking about Europe here, live at the edges, both material and spiritual, of, of, of the mega cities. It is a kind of painful limbo. The sound and the traditions of the first arrivals are gradually, gradually being lost. And yet, as it has been almost now for 2,000 years from the arrival from India, the gypsy perhaps still maintain a kind of manageable position into, in our postmodern world, which is both more fluid and, and more uncertain, uncertain than ever. Still, gypsies have had some influence on the general Western culture, notably in graphic art and painting. In this painting of around 1690 by David Terniers, Tenier, a gypsy woman, reads the hand of a man, a fortune-telling, as mentioned being one of the connotations of gypsy activities. And a similar occurrence is depicted, shown in this painting of 1617 by Lionel Spada. The protagonists in the painting uh, are two gypsies who read the fortune to a wealthy gentleman, a note, meanwhile, that a third gypsy steals his purse. And in a story half true and half legend, a gypsy by the name of Antonio Solario falls in love with the daughter of an appliance manufacturer in Naples who also supplied the royal household of the time. The girl's father is horrified at the idea of his daughter marrying a gypsy. And then the gypsy resorted to ask Queen Joanne to help, to help him. And the queen said that if he, the gypsy, had, come on, had become a good artist or a fine artist and could guarantee a good living to the girl, she would intervene, the queen that is, she would intervene with the unrelenting father. The gypsy painter left Naples and went to study painting in, in Rome and in Bologna. And uh, returning after nine years, he returned and he proposed incognito to make a painting of the queen. And the queen was so impressed, so impressed by the result that she intervened with the father of the girl to allow, to allow the marriage. And this is one of the painting of Antonio Solario, also called, for that reason, as I explained in this legend, of this legend, also called Antonio the Gypsy. The painting actually here represents Mary and St. Joseph and him, who, the, the third part, the third person is him who commissioned, is he who commissioned who commissioned the painting. In this other painting by Austrian painter Alois Schramm, a gypsy tries to convince two women to acquire a shawl that she has made and has for sale. In the world of music, the most popular gypsy character is that of Carmen, the protagonist of the famous opera by Bizet. Carmen is a beauty in the city of Seville, and she is the object of envy and is wrongly accused of a murder. However, a police corporal by the name of Jose falls in love with her and helps her escape to a den of smuggler in the vicinity. Jose has given up everything to be with Carmen, but Carmen falls in love with a bullfighter called Escamillo, and in the last act, Jose, furious with jealousy, stabs, stabs Carmen to death. And the gypsy, Esmeralda, is also, is also the protagonist of Victor Hugo's novel Notre Dame de Paris, as is shown in this painting, where Esmeralda gives a sip of water to the condemned man, the condemned man who's called Quasimodo. And with this novel, Victor Hugo shows to the reading community, if you like, of the 19th century, what it means to be irremediably different, irremediably different as gypsies are. In the end, Esmeralda 
betrayed and abandoned by all, find in, in, in her dedication to the handicapped Quasimodo her reason for living. And this painting by the French Emile Hesbens, painted in the 19th century, shows and symbolizes the tradition of music and singing associated with the gypsies. In fact, if you know, if you remember, the crescendo rhythms of Hungary, uh, rhythms of Hungary and Romania music, and also of, of Liszt, Liszt's Hungarian rhapsodies, or the Romanian, or for the matter, the Romanian rhapsody of George Enescu, are examples of a typical gypsy musical style, where from a calm beginning we proceed to a wild and frenzy and frenzied finale. One curious event that gathers gypsies from various points in Europe is the Gypsy Festival that occurs every year in the community of saint mary de la mer in France, where there where the Rhone River turns into marshes before ending in the Mediterranean Sea, and there's a beautiful park there. The reason for the festival is the celebration of Sarah, who was a servant of the Mary, who in turn was the mother of the apostles of the apostles John, John and James. The church contains also the relics of three Marys, of Mary Salome, Mary Magdalene, and Mary Jacobi, I don't know, Jacobi, who was, who was the cousin of Mary, the actual mother of Christ. So there are four Marys altogether. The legend goes that the three Marys that left, the, the, the three Marys that, to whom the church is dedicated in France, left Jerusalem to escape prosecution after the death of Christ. They boarded a boat without, without rudder and sailors, and the boat miraculously, miraculously landed on the wild land of the Camargue, land that even today has maintained some of the original wild and wild feel. Sarah, the protector saint of the gypsies, believed in the miracle and attended and looked after the three Marys. The Camargue was often the target of pirate incursions, and the local church has the, because you can see, as the appearance of a fortress. It was built in the, in the 12th century, and the festival has a long tradition. And, and this is also a front page of a magazine of 1908 showing the Gypsy Festival. One final note is that the magazine refers to the Gypsies as Bohemians or Bohemiens, a name that, th though through lexical magic, has maintained the suggestion of an unconventional, an unconventional lifestyle, but not suggesting the feel of disenfranchisement associated with the term gypsy. And this is the end of our historical sketch on gypsies. I thank the crew, and in particular our director, Kat Iverson. Thank you for watching. This is Jimmy Molia for Historical Sketches, and see you next time.